Hello, and welcome to Bringing Adaptive Leadership into IT, The Case for Agility. I'm Jerry Murphy, Senior Vice President of Research and Consulting for Nemerides. Joining me is John Burke, who's our Chief Technology Officer, and Don Vandergriff, Director of Adaptive Leadership Training. Uh, I will encourage everyone who's participating to, if you have any questions along the way, uh, please feel free to submit them. There's a, a, a place there in your bar that you can uh, submit questions. And um, and there's also some attachments there. I'll talk to a little bit more at the end um, so that you can hopefully have some further interaction with us in the future. All right. With that, uh, our agenda for today's talk is going to be talking a little bit about adaptive leadership. What is it? And we're going to be talking about how you can take the concept of adaptive leadership, which really had its history in military and military training and military strategy and tactics, and how we can bring some of those concepts into uh, the IT process. We're going to be talking about uh, the OODA loop. We'll tell you what that means later, uh, how to plan for training and building adaptive leadership into your training. Um, we're talking about a little bit about how uh, after action views is a part of this process and why you want to repeat this stuff. And then after that, we'll talk about what are some of the next steps you can have on bringing adaptive leadership training into IT. After that, we'll open it up for the floor for any questions uh, that you might have. And I have one person who already has questions uh, saying that our video is not displaying. Um, I'm not sure if that's still the case. I I'm I don't know what to tell you about that. I mean, I see John, I see you, and I see Don. Do you guys see the slides? Yeah. Yeah. I see everything. Hmm. I don't know what to tell you, Lisa. Uh, we are seeing it here. So I apologize if you can just uh, shoot us an email later. We'll, we'll try to figure this out with um, Bright Talk later. But as far as I can tell, it looks like uh, it's here. Maybe you ask us that before we start presenting. So um, hopefully, hopefully that's I, the case. I'll uh, drop a note to support right now. Okay, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. All right. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, adaptive leadership. What is it? One of the things about being adaptive is if you're going to have adaptive leadership, which is how you can react to circumstances that you can't always control, some of what, in order to do that, you have to assume is there's got to be a certain level of maturity on the individual actor. We as managers have to trust that the people underneath us understand what our intentions are. We have confidence in their ability to use their own judgment so that we don't have to tell them how to do every single thing, which is really important because so often in life, especially in today's environment with so many different security threats are coming on board, you never know what the next thing's going to be sometimes. And we have to give our people the ability to use their, their own judgment. If we're going to act in these dynamic environments, uh, I want to trust that they can do the right thing. Um, and the reality is we, we can't, as much as we want to meticulously plan all the parts of our environment, it's very difficult to do. Uh, especially today. If you think about, you know, in the beginning, when the only computer out there was a mainframe, you had one place you controlled everything. Then we went to distributed computing where I probably controlled the servers and apps, but I, maybe I don't control the endpoint. Now you look at today's environment where we have cloud-based applications and services where we control very little of it, right? My customer relationship management is at salesforce.com. My trouble ticketing system is being used with ServiceNow. I've got my accounts payable being used with ADT or, you know, uh, all these types of things, ADP, uh, I don't control a lot of that. And and with the security threats that are coming in here. So as much as I used to be able to have a very detailed list of how to do everything, it becomes harder and harder today to develop specific rules that can take account of every single circumstance that's going to be brought to bear. And because of that, uh, what we think is an ideal outcome for leaders is for leaders to tell their people what the desired outcome is that I want to have, and then allow the people underneath to use their own experience and knowledge and resources to figure out what is the right thing to do to achieve the outcome uh, that our leaders had. So it's less about telling somebody how to do something 
more telling about what their outcome is and letting them use their own judgment um, to doing that. And in fact, uh, as your environments get more and more complex, the reality is that individual user of the system is probably going to know a lot more about the details of the system than the manager that that person uh, is reporting to. All right, and now I will pass it over to Don to talk to you a little bit about what we mean by this OODA loop. The OODA loop, to give you background, is observe, orient, decide, act loop. It was uh, in detailed after years of intense work, uh, research developed by Colonel John Boyd, U.S. Air Force. And there's really good books on John Boyd. So if you want to look more about him, he was a maverick. He was an uh, innovator. And the best book by uh, James Corm is on board the fighter pilot that changed the, uh, the outlook of war. Uh, so with that, we base our AAR process after action review process on the OODA loop. We are actually, as far as I know, and according to other board acolytes, I'm one of them. Uh, we are the only company that shows you how to do use the OODA loop without a briefing or a lecture. So you want to observe what's going on around you. You want to take in the facts and the assumptions. In our AAR, we teach you how to do that. Assumptions are not facts. They are simply filling in the data I don't have or something I may think is important. But when you do our AR, you find out among a team of people that a lot of different people have different ways of looking at things. And our audiences, our clients always learn from. Orient. This is the most important aspect of the OODA loop. Now, they're all, they're all key to do. But the Orient uh, is you're taking these facts and assumptions and you're determining what you're going to do. And you're going to determine that by identifying the critical fact. Not facts but what are the critical fact and the key assumptions? And then you want to go back to what was your intent from your managerial team or in the police world and military, which we do all of them. What was your end state? What did they want you to do? And, and it's a two way street. They tell you what their desired outcome is and they allow you to figure out how to do it. And then how does my potential action bear on the overall company? That's always important because the orientation that you take may be a deviant or may be harmful. So you have to think about that. So after you do all these things, you decide what to do. Okay. And we talk to you about that. And then once you decide to do, you act, you don't in a, in a culture of mission command or what the Germans called optics tactic, the Prussians optics tactic, which is badly translated into mission command you saw what was going on and you thought, Hey, I've got the intent. So I'm going to do it. And this is how I'm going to do it. So with that, I'll go to the next uh, slide, please. So empire with understanding, we have spent, I mean, I have spent decades studying this, including teaching myself how to speak and read German. My, my, my Sprechen is very poor because I don't practice enough, but the concept of adaptive leadership is based on the development practices of the Prussian army. Moltke became the chief of staff in 1858, and he was there for 30 years. And he developed an education system that built character, strength of character, and empowerment. But this was derived from Frederick the Great, who is greatly misunderstand, uh, misunderstood in that he, he never court-martialed a subordinate for making a de bad decision, as long as they made a decision, which was very, very important to establishing the pitch, a culture of empowerment. And by, and so this term optics tactic was discussed for decades, but was finally translated into doctrine, which the Germans don't have a word for that, but it was finally translated into a use in the 1888 uh, field manual regulations. And basically what it is, is I tell you what my vision is and you figure out how to do it. And alongside that, the, the advanced learning, which is even advanced for today, the they use decision games, what if scenarios, but most important is these students had to defend their courses of action in front of peers, superiors, and subordinates and had the character to say why in their own words. And I will pass this off to John. 
and we'll talk a little let's bit about, talk about how we don't talk into mute. Um, <laughs> let's talk about getting alt uh, into the culture of information technology, which is, of course, the, the world that I, I came up in. I spent about 18 years in IT departments before coming to the Murdy's. And uh, one of the biggest hurdles to bringing alt into an organization is that the folks on the IT side of the fence have to really understand and really internalize the, the mission of the business overall, not the mission of the IT department inside the business, but the mission of the business first and the organization's overall objectives. And within that context, it's then possible to, to understand what IT's mission has to be and what its objectives to try and achieve that goal or that set of goals, uh, realize that mission, what those objectives need to be. Um, that kind of alignment with the business, what the business needs, what the business expects is really critical for the success of IT within the organization. And it's especially important uh, if IT folks at any level, all the way up to the CIO, are going to make good decisions and properly prioritize the things they have to do and the money they have available to spend. Because ultimately, uh, so much of what we can or can't accomplish comes down to whether there are resources available to accomplish it. So what's prioritized and what gets the money uh, critically important. And that really, you know, leaves you in a position where if, if you do need to cut the budget or, or somebody tells you the budget has been cut, um, you can properly prioritize your now more limited resources uh, towards the activities and uh, efforts that will best advance the goals of the business overall, best advance the, the mission of the business. And... <clears throat> In order to get this different framework for thinking uh, inculcated into the staff, in order to really develop within them this set of skills for approaching problems and solving problems, uh, the key is training and not just a, a one and done kind of uh, 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 nod to the idea of training, but regularly repeated training. Uh, when we work with organizations on this, we suggest training at least quarterly. Uh, you know, honestly, it could be less often than that if that's all you can manage, but you got to do it more than once and you got to do it uh, on, a, on a schedule. The uh, gist of a training episode is to uh, take a group of individuals and put them in a, a scenario uh, preferably to start with an unfamiliar scenario, something that's outside their day-to-day -day experience. Uh, we often use uh, historical military episodes of one sort or another from one conflict or another as the starting point to get people used to the, the overall process of going through one of these, um, <clears throat> one of these decision games. Uh, but uh, the scenarios can evolve over time or you can switch from something in an other environment to something in your own environment. But the, the key is to do them again and again with different scenarios, radically different or evolved scenarios uh, to, through repetition, build confidence. And it's not just building an individual's confidence in their own abilities to assess the facts, understand the assumptions they're bringing along with them, understand the objectives that have been explained to them and make a decision about what to do next. It's not just their own confidence in, in doing that, but their confidence in the people that they work with, their confidence in the other folks who are taking part in the game. Um, and it also, uh, because it builds that confidence in their abilities and the means by which they're making decisions, it builds trust uh, amongst folks who are working together. And it also uh, teaches people how to communicate with each other more clearly and more effectively in any kind of a situation. And so it is, um, it's crucial to the overall success and the development of individuals to do it not just once, but many times and uh, in some kind of regular cadence.
and I just want to make a couple quick points, right? It, it's so often people just do it once and it's because it's regulatory required. Oh, we got to do our annual security retraining. We got to do our annual DR training. And the problem is if you only do it once a year, you're going to be really rusty because uh, well, I did that six, seven months ago. You have an actual security incident or an actual disaster. It may be the, the people I practice with aren't the same people. And I will also say that regardless of how many times you train something, especially I find this with like ransomware security incidents, whatever you practice, Murphy's Law is like, that's probably not what's going to be happening in real life. But the point is not so much that, what do I know? Do I know what to do and who to talk to if server number 17 crashes? It's that when something goes wrong and it's a server and I'm the networking guy, at least I know the guy who's responsible for servers. So, I, hey, I know I can talk to Don for that. I know I can talk to Tim about the database. Oh, we need to call the FBI. I know who that person is because I practiced and I, I know who to call on the phone. So it's not just that I know how to handle an incident. When you have uncertainty, which you will have, you feel comfortable in being able to trust people that aren't necessarily in the group of people you work with every day that I can count on. I know that Don is going to be able to figure out the database stuff. I know Tim's going to be able to figure out the networking stuff and so on. And with that, we culminate the learning with the after action review, which is the next uh, slide. Training the UDA style, okay? Build training around decision games. What are decision games? Well, actually the irony with using training with what we do, but that's a word everyone understands, is learning and development and education develop people for the future or for the unknown. Training builds you for the known. But when you use decision games, how we facilitate them, by the way, we're proud to say we use this internally before ourselves as well in making decisions. We all do, and, and Numertes uses it. So what we preach, we practice. Anyway, decision games are facilitated. What do we mean by that? We get you to do the talking. If we talk more than 20% of any session, we're in the wrong because we want you to take ownership of the learning. And the games focus, again, like I said earlier about the OODA loop, how to use it, not just a lecture, which I've reviewed 33 different courses over the last few years. And except for ours, they all use PowerPoint briefings. This is the OODA loop. This is how it looks. This is, this is how you use it. But we actually put you in situations where you have to employ and then understand how to use it. <clears throat> and certainly of mine, everything we do now is uncertainty. And going back on what both John and Jerry said earlier about uh, doing this once a year well the environment is changing so fast that you're doing yourself disservice and even quarterly which would be ideal given the timelines and the time squeezes we're in would be great because you're always evolving either like uh, jerry said with personnel turnover or as john mentioned the the, the, the evolution of technology the, the evolution of how enemies can attack you no matter what the environment through your cyber cyberspace so you have to do this and we've got a way that allows you to manage and do this and the really good news is people all we have never gotten negative comments i have been doing this now for quite a few years on my own i've introduced it into the military and some law enforcement and now with numerities we're introducing it to non-military and non-law enforcement organizations everyone wants more the only barrier has been they say they don't have enough time, uh, but but they want more because they got so much out of it. These these environments that we create as close as we can create high pressure. We use limited time, limited information to make you think quicker. But it's a, in a fail safe environment, you could fail and no one's going to stand over you and say, "Oh, you're all messed up." Okay, so. You learn from failure. That's very important. We all know about when we were little kids, we were told not to touch the hot stove and we still touched it. And as a matter of fact, we learn from that. So there's a lot, the Marines grappling with that right now about allowing failure in development and learning and training in order to learn from it, because they're a very uh, big organization. We never fail. Well, you never learn if you don't fail and then do an AER on it. So the low constant, 
that's what I was just talking about, the low consequential environments. We want you to take ownership of learning because you're in a fail-safe environment, as we call it. That means I can fail and learn from it and get better. And uh, one thing I was just thinking about, Don, is, you know, we yeah. actually had a recent phone call. We were talking to people is I think one of the important things for a leader is to give the authority to act to the people below them. Yeah. But then the leader takes responsibilities for their action. I think one of the things that destroys trust is when you throw people under the bus. It's like, oh, I didn't you didn't have permission to do this. You know, right, and then people are afraid to act. But if yeah. we as leaders tell our people to make use your judgment to make a call then they do uh, one if they succeed absolutely give them credit for it and say hey you know john did this phenomenal thing and if it failed say hey i was responsible for this endeavor it failed it's on me so let me, let me you take responsibility but you give put the authority down jerry great points let me add real quick before uh, we kick into this on the train no develop uh it's very important in the military and law enforcement, the biggest mistake they make after they say they're going to adapt mission command and adapt the leader training is they implement it without developing their people. You must develop your people on how to do this. That's part of your leadership. You just don't go, I've been told, oh, you're the SME on mission command. Go do mission command. I'm like, I need more than that. Well, you're the expert. I said, no, I need a lot more everything we've talked about. So you owe it to your people to give them environment where they know how to use this, because as we find out through through uh, our discussions with many potential clients, they, they say they use this stuff, and then we find out they don't really understand it because it's so much different. And with that, I'll pass it on to John. I actually it's over to me. Okay. Um, and so we, we actually were debating whether or not we even call this uh, adaptive leadership development versus adaptive leadership training. One of the problems we have with the word training is it kind of implies – that we're telling somebody else what to do. You take this step, you do this step, you do this step. And after you've done these 15 steps, you'll have successfully completed something. Uh, that largely applies in sort of static environments. If you think about the industrial revolution where it's like, I have a fixed facility, I put somebody here, you screw this lug on, after the lug's on, somebody else puts the fender on, you put the engine in and everything works great. Uh, the problem is, that kind of static learning and the rote memorization of something does not work well if the environment is constantly changing. And think about today, forget the security stuff, just with the rapid application development that we have um, where it's just in time, you know, just in time manufacturing, just in time delivery. Uh, things are so rapid and, and, and changing so fast that you it's impractical uh, and un, unachievable really to sit there and, try to give somebody the 10 step process for doing things because they change too much. These environments today are really not static. I talked earlier about the fact that you've got multiple clouds. You don't even own those environments. And I don't even know what changes the companies are going to make to the applications that I'm, that I'm using that are integral to my business. On top of that, it's pretty obvious to everybody, the cybersecurity environment where there's just massive constant threats. And the problem is uh, it's one thing to say, I know there's a threat out there. I'm going to make sure I put this patch in for that specific threat. More and more, we have these zero-day attacks where the first time I'm finding out about a threat is when it's being exploited on me right now. And if I'm waiting for a vendor to do a patch while my system sits exposed, you know, waiting for a fix, you know, the damage is going to be done before I've taken any action for it. So the rapidity of these kind of things uh, are horrible. Then you look at what's happened with just COVID-19 and the recovery from our, our, our environments, the, how hard it is even to get skills. So when I talk to our clients, it's amazing how many shortages there are with critical skills um, and people are feeling less loyalty to uh, their companies even than they did 10 or 15 years ago even. So when you look at uh, Budgeting uncertainties. I mean, look at the economy. Every time it, it seems like we're getting a great economic indicator, the stock market drops. And then we see one that's bad and it goes up. Uh, it seems like there's just tremendous uncertainty in the economy, uh, the cybersecurity environments, uh, the staffing environments. You know, our environments are static. And, and the, the bad news is they're going to continue being that way, as far as I can tell, for the for foreseeable future. So I think the answer to that is instead of trying to come up with the perfect run book, 
come up with these scenarios, train your envir- your people on these envir- environments, throw in uncertainty, right? I'm training about a process, and now I go to the networking guy. Oh, your networking guy's in the hospital. He just had appendic- an appendectomy. He's not available. What do you do now? <laughs> Excellent <laughs> point. So, you know, the more I can train and throw those kind of, of, of a monkey wrenches into there, the more people will be able to respond and think. And what you realize is nobody's going to know it all. We have to rely on each other. We have to understand what's the overall goal of the business. What are the people I have to work with? And then the absence of one person, how can I modify my approach, uh, bring other people in for help? Do I know who it is that can help me so that I can get the mission developed and all this, what it does is it, it it's less about making the perfect run book. And it's more about building individual employees that have character, that have trust, that know how to communicate with people in the absence of uncertainty or in the presence of uncertainty, they can, they can continue to operate in these environments as opposed to just get hung up and paralyzed. Excellent points all. And we talk about, uh, developing these uh, skills and habits in people uh, in the IT department through these training exercises. And part of the the exercise is going through the scenario and uh, telling everybody in the group what your plan of action in in that situation is, how you personally would direct everyone to achieve the goal and the desired outcome Uh, in that scenario. And that's cool, but making the decisions is only part of what uh, helps you learn the other part. And really the most important part is the after action review, where after everybody's, uh, after somebody has said what their plan of action is, uh, working through that as a group and seeing Um, what other things might have been decided. People ask questions, uh, people try and get you to clarify your thinking through this uh, almost Socratic discussion uh, after you said what you would have done to try and find out why you did uh, what you did. Uh, And working through all that, reflecting on the facts in the situation as you were given, reflecting on the assumptions you made, uh, in making your decisions based on those facts um, and uh, reviewing how you've communicated those things and how people did or didn't understand what you meant. Uh, all of those things emerge in the after action review as uh, uh, drivers for personal development. It's it's understanding how you made decisions, why you made decisions, and how well that worked for the group, how well they understood your decisions and what you were trying to accomplish with them. Uh, all of that uh, turns into the kind of uh, learning that develops the individual. And that is the ultimate goal of the whole process is to develop in individuals these skills and these habits of making decisions, taking responsibility, learning from what happens and moving on to the next. Uh, and uh, I think at this point, I hand back to you, Jerry, or is it over now? Done. Done. Yeah. Okay. Iterate one more for the road. This is so important. We, we could do this in a group. We want to do it in a group environment. Everything we touched upon, the group environment is so important because you learn so much, but more importantly, the under the foundation of Optus Tactical Mission Command in a culture that can react to complex problems quickly is trust. And you build trust through these things. It's remarkable that that comes up over and over. Oh, I didn't know Tim over there could do that. Or the answer that Lisa just gave me helped me out a lot because I didn't know, I didn't think about that as a fact or as an assumption. So it, it starts building the bonding uh, of your team. So we never repeat. I say again, we never repeat with the same scenario. They slowly grow a little bit more complex in some way, or we add a twist to an old scenario, and we always have the same factors. Time could be a little more if it's complex, or it could be what's called a hot seat. 
you have 30 seconds to decide what you're going to do. But all this drives discussion. And it also is, 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 is pertaining to the amount of people available. So what you see over time as this evolves is people get more and more, more and more confident, more and more building your character because you're defending your, your decisions and maybe the decision is not the best one, but you didn't get raked over the coals over it. You actually learn how to get better. So you start seeing people getting better. You start building the teamwork. You start understanding how each other thinks. Because the importance about a team is we all bring strengths and weaknesses to the team. And weaknesses is a bad word. I don't like that. But everyone's familiar with it. We bring attributes to the team that are different. So we do a lot A lot of this. We, we add complications uh, that make you think about what might happen. And the evolving scenario makes you start understanding problems in context because we're real good as a nation. Our public schools are real good about industrial age process task training. But what you want to do at the scale that you're at professionalism is think in context. That's what's important. And with that, I'll pass back to, to Jerry. All right. So now we're just going to come to what are the uh, next uh, steps uh for all, right? <clears throat> what we think, how can I use these concepts that we talked about, about adaptive leadership training and bring them into your current IT environments? So first, instead of inventing something brand new from scratch, look at your existing training and see if you can modify that training you're already doing to bring in these concepts of adaptive leadership. Most of us have to do things like annual DR testing, incident response planning, security event training. Take those things that you have to do and use these types of methods to building uncertainty environments, retraining them. And what we find is when people start to do this, you go from doing them annually, uh, people get really excited about it. We did one of these with a client. The thing went, we, we did it for two days for four hours a day. And it literally felt like it was 15 minutes. Uh, it, you, you get so absorbed in the training. And then when people are absorbed and actively participating, that's when we find they're really learning these things. Next, you know, add situational awareness to things that are not related to IT. And this is one of the early concepts I think Don brought out. Put in an environment that you're not familiar with. That's one of the reasons when we deal with IT people, one of the first things we do are military scenarios because not everybody in IT has been in the military and are familiar with those, gets them out of their comfort zone. They are not experts in those areas. And we did that on purpose. You could do the same thing in IT where you do an environment where you make a database person have to make a networking decision or uh, you have the database person making a security decision. Put them in another environment that they don't have all the information they can do. Police engagements, uh, disaster responses. Obviously, we all had pandemics with COVID. Uh, these are all great things that can help build our abilities to trust people think outside the box, and ultimately build confidence on our ability to observe, orient, decide, uh, and act. And that's what we really want to do is have the point where we, where when we have an uncertain environment, people understand how to uh, deal with these environments. All right. And now we'll just uh, leave it to John to kind of wrap things up here, and then we'll open it to questions. That sounds great. Thanks, Jerry. And uh, yeah, wrapping it up in summary. Um, as we've repeated in multiple ways and context, ALT is about developing leaders who will think on their feet. And whether they're leading a, a team of two or a team of 100, the goals and the skills are the same. It uh, is also that the training process is about improving not just your abilities to, to make those kinds of decisions, but your confidence in making those decisions and your ability to communicate with the people that you work with. Uh, Using decision games as the core of this allows people to confront challenges with some stress because it's all time-driven, but in a very low consequence environment because it's, it's a game. Um, key to the whole process is the after action review where uh, participants can take ownership for, for what they've done and for learning from the questions people asked and the thoughts people had about what they did. Uh, repetition is the key 
to making this successful in the organization over time. And uh, it is critical to uh, mix things up and use new scenarios all the time in order to uh, help keep people uh, agile and responsive to changes in the context and changes in the world around them. Uh, Jerry, back to you. Yeah, okay. So first, I want to say thanks a lot for attending. We did have a couple questions. Uh, Don, somebody asked if you want to mention the, the book you referred to. Could you just mention that again? Because um, I'm not sure if I can display it. I'll try to display it. Uh, Don, you're, you're muted. Robert well, Corm is a, not only a great author, but he's a good friend. Robert Corm, who's a, a big, big time author on bibliographies of, of prominent people. But his book, which has sold over 200,000 copies, is John Boyd, the fighter pilot that changed the art of war. And it's it's about Boyd. And it's it's when I got the draft to proof it, I couldn't put it down. So that but it's about how a person, a character who would not take a contractor job after he retired, lived off his his pension. Uh, so he wasn't obligated to anyone, changed how we thought about war and in the US military. And the first Gulf War was a result of it. All right. Thanks. So uh, another question somebody had is, how can we get in contact with us to talk to us about possibly doing these types of speaking engagements? Uh, if you click on your little attachment set, there's a little paper clip, everybody. If you click there, what you'll see is the attachments are there's a various links that will let you connect with us directly. So you can either uh, there's one at the top with connecting with John Burke. Uh, connect with Jerry, me, uh, you can connect with Don. Those will let you, those will get you to sites that you can find time on our calendars to talk to us. We also invite you to join the Numerities community online. That link is there too. Uh, and there's also links there for upcoming webinars. Uh, speaking of which, uh, one that we have coming up soon is what is quantum computing good for business cases, which is Wednesday, April 26th at, at uh, 12 p.m. That's when you can register for, uh, if you look to the link at the right as well, uh, things that we have done in the past that are ready right now. Uh, do you want to improve cybersecurity war game and cutting the cord going wireless all the time? Those are presentations similar to this one that you can uh, watch on demand uh, if you want to do that uh, right now. And uh, we talked a little bit about the community. Uh, that is where you can interact with both people like us as well as your peers in the industry where you can be talking about various uh, to IT topics that might be of interest to you and uh, they can be there for you. Um, if you want to talk to the community online, it's it's to the tag at the right, but it's also right here, uh, numerities.com forward slash community. Um, that's another way that you can uh, get in touch with us. The replay with this should be available somewhat after this uh, meeting. Uh, and with that, I thank you for your uh, time and attention. It looks like uh, we are displaying there the actual uh, name of the book uh, for you. And um, let me see here. I had another point here. I was in the game industry and VFX, our design strategies are game level designers. Interesting. So uh, we'd love to talk to you more about those types of things. Uh, click on those links, schedule a meeting, and we'd be happy to follow up and talk with you. Um, and with that, I think we have concluded. Uh, here's just a little thing about us and some of the things that we do. And with that, thank you very much for your time and attention. And we appreciate you participating. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks all. Thank you all. <laughs>